I want to welcome everyone to this community conversation on uh, hunger and food insecurity during COVID-19. Um, my name is Lauren schwader Beal. I am the executive director of DC Greens, which is a nonprofit that works to advance food justice and health equity in the nation's capital. I am so excited to be here with three incredible panelists, and I'm gonna give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, this is a very short conversation, so we're gonna dive right in, um, but just wanna let everyone know that there will be an opportunity to ask questions. We'll have a little bit of time for um, audience questions. So please feel free to put uh, any questions in the chat as we go along, or um, you're welcome to chat with each other as well. And um, we will just jump right in. So um, first things first, um, why don't each of you just tell us who you are, what organization you're with, and a little bit about what you do. Um, so I'm gonna take us from left to right on my screen, um, and we'll start with Allison. Great, thanks, Lauren. My name is Allison Padgett. I'm the Director of Development and Outreach at Food for Others. We are the largest provider of emergency free groceries covering Northern Virginia. We are located in Fairfax and serving around 4,000 families per day right now, or sorry, per uh, week right now, which is about twice our normal numbers. And I'm very happy to be here. Great. And Jilna? Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jilna Kachari, and I'm the Director of Development and Communications at Shepherd's Table. Uh, we're a nonprofit in downtown Silver Spring, Maryland. We've been around for uh, uh, just coming up on 37 years. Um, and yeah, like similar to Allison, we've remained open every single day during COVID um, and really grateful to be a direct services organization um, serving right now. Great, and Regina, and I'll just say to those who are arriving, Regina is going to be over audio, um, but we'll, we'll be uh, graced by her beautiful um, headshot in the meantime. <laughs> um, please. Thanks, thanks, Lauren, and thanks everyone for your, your time today. My name is Regina, and sorry I don't have my video. I'm having um, all kinds of tech issues, so let's just add that to um, all of this, um, you know, fatigue that we that we have. But so happy to be with you all. Um, I'm the executive director of Food Recovery Network, and we are a national nonprofit where we support college students all across the country to recover surplus food from their dining halls and surrounding restaurants. We also support businesses and events to do the same thing. And with the um, advent of the um, horrific pandemic, we are you know, shifting um, from prepared foods on higher ed campuses and events and things while things have been shuttered. And we moved a bit closer to the starting line of the food system where we're supporting farmers to get their precious food off their farm fields um, and into the hands of of organizations like Food for Others, um, you know, I'm so glad to hear about this organization um, that helps to feed um, our our neighbors and our loved ones all across the country. That's great. So um, this next question, I'm really going to open up for whoever wants to speak, and you know, I, I hope we'll be able to hear from all of you. Um, so, how has COVID impacted food security and food insecurity for your clients or community? I mean, we know that this has been a major topic. Um, across the country and is certainly hitting our region very hard. So I'd love to hear um, from your perspective, from each of your organizations, um, what, are, what are you seeing the impacts um, with the community and the clients that you serve? Uh, we're seeing a larger proportion of new clients, people who've never needed food before. I had one lady who had worked at the Washington Convention Center for 30 years and was laid off at the beginning of COVID. So people like that who never needed food and suddenly find themselves in difficult circumstances. And of course, all the lines you see at food banks on the news and things, that is very much a reality, even here in a relatively wealthy area. You know, and for Shepherd's Table, uh, we serve people who are, uh, most of the people that we serve are either homeless or living in poverty. And for especially the population that is experiencing homelessness, um, it was an added challenge for them just because they had nowhere to go. And all of a sudden, even in the shelters, you're social distancing, and so there's less capacity. Um, so being an organization that was providing multiple meals a day, um, a lot of them were just really grateful that at least they didn't have to worry about food um, because they can't, you know, take go to a food bank and get canned food because they have nowhere to cook it. Um, so, yeah, it just made it all the more difficult for, for the population we serve. 
And this is Regina uh, echoing everything that we just heard from these two amazing people. Um, I would also add to that um, just another, um, a few examples. Um, we saw uh, lots of um, large events, civic centers, um, you know, shutter, and they were sort of left with all of this extra food. And so we did our best to help them proportion that food out to food banks. And again, like these two amazing organizations that are with us today. Um, and then that food sort of got redistributed. And then we saw on the, as I mentioned before, on the, on the farmer side, all these contracts that farmers had that were canceled. So they were growing all these amazing, um, all this amazing produce with suddenly no buyers. Um, and so we're working to figure out, okay, well, how can we get this food to those long lines, um, you know, that Shepherd's Table is, is seeing um, that's being exacerbated. Um, and so we're seeing that. And then also with um, schools closing very quickly, let's not forget that there are way too many um, students in higher education that are also food insecure. We're seeing with you know schools being remote that folks would go to these institutions, young people, children would be at school. This is where they would have their breakfast, this is where they would have their lunch. And suddenly they don't have the opportunity um, to have those precious meals um, in these locations. So those are some of the things that we've seen at Food Recovery Network. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I know I've noticed um, in working together with uh, some of the direct service um, food organizations in, in DC is that, um, you know, a lot of how they had to operate really changed um, during COVID, whether it was, you know, because the um, direct service programs often will have sort of congregant feeding sites or, you know, because there's been such a sort of underinvestment by our society in the safety net, um, you know, so much is relies on volunteer labor, a lot of which I know was really hard to find. So I'm wondering how have each of your operations had to shift um, in, in light of all of the challenges that COVID has brought? We lost almost all our, well, sorry, our volunteers at first and ended up hiring seven temporary staff members. And so that was a real struggle. The supply chains completely broke and we were saved by places like office cafeterias, the kind of places Regina is talking about where they got us food from restaurants that were closed in catering companies. Um, but I think the biggest change that we've made is trying to get more food directly where it's needed. So people don't have to come to us anymore. We're opening a lot of mobile sites pushing more food through community partners, that sort of thing. Trying so we're not so concentrated in our warehouse and our parking lot, but really getting it out to where it's needed. And I'd say on our end, um, we're actually made some similar pivots. So we served our meals, they're prepared hot meals uh, in, a, in, in a really nice dining room. Uh, Pre-COVID, of course, once everything kind of shut down, we moved everything outside, we were packaging it in um, to-go containers and people could take it. We put up tents, you know, and then slowly you go from being able to have 50 chairs to 10 chairs to no chairs. Um, and so people were having meals literally in the parking lot. Uh, luckily, the weather, you know, wasn't too bad for the most part. Once we could open the dining room, we did um, at, a, at a very limited capacity. But the other pivot that we made um, is actually once we got really good at making to-go meals, and we realized, hey, food insecurity is going up, but we haven't seen that much of a rise in the number of people that are coming to our facility for the meals. So we decided to get a van and go into the neighborhoods and distribute meals. Um, and I think that's really the path forward. And that's that's we're turning that into a permanent program because we just realized, hey, this is a thing and um, we got to respond and we got to respond now. Actually, not too long ago, that that's so um, amazing to hear that on the ground um, pivots. This is Regina again. We were actually, um, we get calls and emails all the time from um, what we call nonprofit partner agencies. So again, these awesome, you know, Food for Others, Shepherd's Table. These are what we would call, um, for, you know, with FRN, our hunger fighting partner agencies. Um, we work with over 350 all across the country. Um, we we would get some questions from them of like how how can we be creative about feeding people when it's cold out so you know the tents and things like that you know just love hearing that creativity and thinking about well, what can we do when it gets colder you know and especially in the northeast here 
for Food Recovery Network, some of the pivots that we've had to make are, well, let's just talk about funding for a second. You know, we're going to have a webinar for our partner agencies, for the nonprofits. Some of them have done quite well um, pivoting upon pivot to, um, you know, talk with funders to keep that precious dollars coming in. Um, and we want to honor and recognize that. So we will have a mm -hmm. webinar um, e either this month or in December specifically about that, because for our nonprofits that where we donate our food, that's one of the main things that they ask us about is, you know, not only can you help us by, you know, giving us donated food, but hey, we need to think about fundraising. So we want to provide that resource to folks. Um, but we we also, you know, with students, literally some of them had to vacate their campuses like that week. You know, if it was like Wednesday, you have to be gone by Friday. Oh my goodness, that I couldn't even imagine. You're 18, 19 years old and, and having, and, and let's not assume that they had a place to go. Many students do, of course, but not everyone. Um, and we got a lot of calls from our students saying we, we, we aren't on college campuses. Um, we're not going to be able to recover all the surplus food in our dining halls. Um, so what FRN did is we expanded what it meant to be an official chapter. And that expansion actually ties into our bigger systems change work, which is, again, this awesome work that we're seeing at Shepherd's Table and Food for Others. There is a line of people who are outside like, looking for food. And at FRN, we want to make sure that not only do we want to lessen the line, we want there to be no line. Um, and so we can do that through advocacy, through um, policy changes. And these are things that our students are really interested in. So one of the expansions on being an official chapter is you can do some advocacy work, some um, education work. Um, so that was one of the big pivots that we had that, that really tied into um, our, our strategy work. And then really focusing in on our businesses. Food is all over the place. So, you know, your corporate dining halls, things like that. Um, if you don't have a recovery plan right now, if, if, you, if your dining has been suspended because of the pandemic, well, let's have this conversation now so we can build that plan. So when people are coming back into their offices and, and those cafeterias are starting back up, you have a plan in place. So Food Recovery Verified is a program we had in place before the pandemic, but we're really talking to a lot more businesses um, to get that recovery plan in place. That's great. We have four minutes now um, until we're opening up to questions from the audience. And I just, I mean, this has already gone so fast and I have so much to talk about here. Um, and I have, you know, a couple of really pressing questions. So I'm going to say all of them and then you all pick which ones you want to talk about. But um, one question I have is what are you most worried about around food insecurity in our region over the next six months? What needs to change to better support people experiencing food insecurity locally? And how can people support your work? And, you know, you, you choose whatever you want from that. And why don't we try and do about a minute and a half each? Allison, oh, you're up. I'm up. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Lots of questions. So um, as far as what we're worried about, you know, we, we know it took 10 years after 2008 to recover from that recession. We hope it's not 10 years again, but it very well could be as people's finances get more and more in the hole, it gets harder and harder to keep, keep the balls up in the air. So we feel like this is going to go on long after most of us have lost interest in the topic. And I hope that people will stay aware that food insecurity is going to be an issue for a long time. As far as how you can help, I would say look Look hyper-local, look at your neighborhood food pantry, your food recovery, go to your grocery store, ask them what they're doing with the food at the end of the day. Are they donating to someone? I'm sure there is a food recovery network or a food pantry who would take it. So look at food waste and food issues in your own neighborhood and see if you can make a difference there. That's what I would definitely suggest. Uh, there's a third question. I forgot what it was. What was it? I think you got them. I think those were, they, 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 they all flowed together. It was a beautiful okay, answer. <laughs> <laughs> Jilna, what about um, you? Sure. So uh, I'll tackle the in terms of how um, sorry, in terms of what we think that we were worried about is uh, mainly just making sure that the funding that has come in this year that has enabled us to really expand our services way more than we did before. Just making sure that that's going to continue for as long as we're going to need it. You know, like Regina was saying, there's been so much generosity. So um, one thing that we're thinking about is, is you know, how do we ensure that that continues um, for as long as we're going to need it? 
And in terms of how people can support, I mean, I would say Shepherd's Table has been so incredibly blessed to have a community that just kind of rallied. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, we realized we're not getting the donated desserts and bread that we used to get. Um, so community, you know, people who are at home thought, okay, well, I can make sandwiches um, that we hand out in the middle of the day. I can make cookies. I can make brownies. I can make Rice Krispie treats, you know, just little ways to find the family to get involved. Um, but at the end of the day, somebody's going to enjoy that. And um, it's it's well worth it. So I'd say just similar to what Allison said, just look in your neighborhood, look in your city, look where you are. Um, there's always ways to get involved if a financial gift is not um, most comfortable for you. Great. And Regina, a minute and a half. I have to echo everything that I've heard. Thank you both so much for these awesome examples. I'm just feeling so inspired and hungry. Rice Krispie treats, yes. Um, I want to say one of the, the worry. Oh, yeah, it's there. I, I have to definitely uh, underscore that. Um, so I won't iterate on, on that because I think we all know what that feels like. Um, but some of the things that need to change, how about, um, you know, we need to ask the bigger corporations that we all rely on to pay a living wage because when people have the resources to make their own ends meet to um, get the resources they need for their families then again we can get rid of that line so frn is committed to that um, we're working to increase our budget so that every single person that we are able to hire is paid a living wage we also need a, a demand for um, things that need to change a lot of these farmers that are big farmers and that's that's an awesome thing but they rely on one big customer for all of their produce well with some of the work that we're doing at food recovery network we make those relationships actually a lot more rapid where are their local restaurants where are their local marketplaces for all of this awesome food when when the regular distribution is disrupted as the pandemic has done for way too many farmers all across the country so thinking about what are the different tiered relationships that we can um, an act for our farmers all the time. They're there when they need them. And then lastly, I would say um, how people can support. Please be in touch, be involved with FRN. We'd love to talk with you. We have a bunch of, of webinars coming up that's talking about our work. We're being very public about our learning through this um, framework that I mentioned, this FRN 10X. We want to be very public in our learning. We have lots of pilots where people can touch the work and be involved. So I would say, please, please, please um, be in touch and let every single person that you know, know about Food for Others and Shepherd's Table. We got to keep spreading the word about these awesome organizations. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and putting on my DC Greens hat, I'll just add to everything that you're saying. Um, I think it's so important that we take this moment and uh, make sure that our policymakers remember that access to, to food and access to healthy food is a basic human right, and that it cannot be something that gets pushed off onto the nonprofit sector to kind of figure out for itself. Um, this really needs to be something that gets baked into our policies and recognized as a component of what our what our cities and our states and our government needs to be doing for its people. So that's that's my little plug. Um, so uh, I, I would just, I'll open it up. I think we maybe have like two minutes if um, there are any questions from people who are, are watching. I think you can just pop something in the, um, in the chat and Regina has been populating it with uh, great uh, ways to get in touch with her and, and cheering others on. So, um, Please make use of the chat if anyone has a question. Uh, Jilna, could you share the best way to reach Shepherd's Table, please, in the um, in the chat sure. as as well? Um, so I'd say the and I and I'm guessing you mean to get to our location. We're very close to the downtown Silver Spring Metro, so if you need to come that way, that's great. Um, believe me, if you pop your uh, your website in the in the yeah, chat, also I can do that. Okay. <laughs> nobody's <laughs> traveling what do you mean by that but, um yeah of course i mean we're we're an organization that's open literally 365 days a year so you can also always call us and i'll put our address um in there as well thank you well i you know i want to thank you all for your incredible work i know we've all been um 
I know that our whole sector around food insecurity has really risen to meet the challenge of the moment. And it's been a, a, a privilege to be able to be working in a, um, in a region that has um, so much connection and so much passion for making sure that everybody is able to eat. Um, so we are going to close down this session. Um, again, thank you to these incredible panelists. Thank you to everyone who's been watching. Um, we're going to go to the main stage now to hear some quick advice on how to get more engaged locally and some thoughts and reflections about the evening. So um, thanks again for everybody being here and um, we'll see you over at the main stage. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, everyone. Bye.